It's been four years since the last U.S. presidential election, so over the next few months, states will be holding their primaries, and in November, Americans will vote for who they want to be the President of the United States. In America, the Electoral College adds another dimension to things, but the basic idea of a voting system is that each agent in a population states their preference, and some mathematical function combines those all into a result. But the mathematical function that we almost always use, the one that feels correct, that feels fair, is picking the option that gets the most votes. In fact, we use this system almost as a definition of fair. If kids are trying to decide what movie to watch, their parents will ask them to vote. Because we see voting as fair, we tend to assume certain properties about it. For example, there should be no dictator. There should be no single person that can change the outcome regardless of other votes. That's a little bit obvious, but we can generalize it and say all votes should be weighted equally. Another intuitive property of voting is that if everybody votes unanimously, the outcome is what people voted for. Seems pretty obvious. We can also say that voting should be continuous. Small changes in votes should lead to small changes in the outcome. These things sound kind of dumb to say because they are so overwhelmingly obvious, but it is mathematically impossible for a voting system to satisfy all of these properties at the same time. You might have heard of Arrow's impossibility theorem, which shockingly states that several other common expectations of voting like this are paradoxical. In this video, we're going to look at the similar Chichilinski, Chichilinski. In this video, we're going to look at the similar Chichilinski impossibility theorem, which states that an ordinal voting system cannot be continuous, respect anonymity, and respect unanimity all at the same time. The reason I care about this as a math and science YouTube channel, and the reason that you should care, is because the argument is entirely topological, and it is one of the most unexpected uses of a Mobius strip. And here's the big twist. This video is actually a sequel to my Mobius strip piano video. But if you haven't seen it yet, that's fine. Keep watching. In order to talk about voting mathematically, we need a way to formally describe what people want. So we're going to steal some tools from economics. A voter or a consumer's preference can be cardinal, where they have individual scores in their head for each option, or ordinal, where the options are ranked relative to each other. To represent a cardinal preference, we use a function that has one input dimension for each political issue or good, and it outputs a number that says how much we like that combination. This is called a utility function, and we pretend that each person has this in their head. If we draw a curve, or a hypersurface, that includes all of the combinations of goods that give the same utility, then we get what we call an indifference curve. For ordinal preferences, like voting, where we pick the thing we want most regardless of how much we want it, two people will have the same preference if their indifference curves are the same. In other words, we don't care about the magnitude of somebody's opinion, only the direction. If we represent a cardinal preference with two goods or political issues as a two-dimensional vector, then the length of that vector represents how strong a person's opinions are, and the direction represents which issue they care about most. Once a person votes, the strength of their opinions becomes irrelevant to the person who reads the ballot, so an ordinal preference is represented by a normalized vector, a vector with a magnitude of 1. If that's how we represent one person's preference, what is the space of all possible preferences? Well, it's a circle. A unit circle. Every point on the circle is the same distance from the center, and every point corresponds to a different direction. If there were more issues that we were concerned about, the preference space would be a sphere or a hypersphere, and if there was only one issue, it would be two points. For the sake of visualization, I'm going to stick to two dimensions, so a one-dimensional sphere, also known as a circle. Like I said in the introduction, a voting system is effectively a mathematical function that takes in each voter preference and returns a result. We want our function to be continuous, we want it to weight each vote equally, in other words, it should be invariant to permutations, or anonymous, because nobody's vote matters more than anyone else's, and we want it so that if everybody votes unanimously, the outcome is whatever people voted for. To make this easy to visualize, we're going to pretend that only two people are voting. With two voters, the set of all possible combinations of votes will be the Cartesian product of each preference space. Since the preference spaces are circles, we can unwrap them onto a plane, 
and since a circle wraps around when you reach 360 degrees, we'll draw arrows to remind us that these edges should be taped together. Any point on the square represents a combination of the two voters' preferences. If you tape together this square at its edges, you can see that it becomes a donut, a torus. But remember, one of the properties of a voting system is that it's anonymous. The result should be the same if two people's votes are switched. So any two points across the diagonal will lead to the same result. That means that we can fold over the square into a triangle. When we do that, you have to keep the arrows from earlier. If you try to tape this, you'll have a hard time because those two edges go in different directions. So what you do is cut it in half, tape it, then reattach the edges that you cut. Now you have a Mobius strip. The topological space of all possible vote combinations is a Mobius strip. Now, if you've been watching this channel for a little bit, you might be getting deja vu. I use this exact same explanation in my video about the Mobius strip piano. In that video, we saw that the configuration space of all combinations of two musical notes is a Mobius strip. And it's for the exact same reason. Musical notes wrap around once you reach an octave, so they're topologically a circle, and permutations of the same notes are equivalent. My performance of Star Spangled Banner from the beginning of this video was done on a new and improved version of the Mobius strip piano. Although it is a notebook and not a Mobius strip, it would be a Mobius strip if you cut it in half. I made one in Mobius form too, it's just harder to play. Since that video, the team over at MicroKits sent me the cutest little synthesizers that even come in a little cassette box so that I could hook them up to a Mobius strip. Before I programmed the capacitive sensors myself with an Arduino, and I was pretty limited by the hardware, but now I have each strip of this copper tape hooked up to one of the synthesets keys so that each point on the grid plays two notes. It plays a lot more like an instrument and a lot less like a science experiment. So the topological space of all voting combinations is a Mobius strip. Why do we care? Well, remember that our goal is to find a continuous function that maps the Cartesian product of the preference spaces to another preference space. That is, map a Mobius strip to a circle. Map all of the votes to a result. The other property that we haven't used yet is the unanimity requirement. If everybody votes the same, the result is the same. When the two voters make the same vote, that point is on the diagonal of the Mobius square, so once we cut and retape it into strip form, unanimous points are all along the edge of the Mobius strip. So according to the unanimity requirement, voting must be a continuous map from a Mobius strip onto its own boundary. But here's the problem, that map is impossible. Imagine that you take a Mobius strip and draw a line through the center. If you squeeze the edges of the strip to shrink it down, it's possible to squeeze it down so much that the entire strip retracts into that central line. If you do this with a cylinder instead of a Mobius strip, you can retract the cylinder into any circle. The center, the top edge, bottom edge, doesn't matter. But the edge of a Mobius strip is different. Namely, there's only one of them, and it's twice as long. You can see that when I peel the top layer off of the strip, it becomes a circle that's twice the circumference of the original strip, and it's tangled with the original too. This becomes a problem when we try to retract the Mobius strip onto its boundary. In fact, it's an impossible problem. We can't do that. The boundary of a Mobius strip is not a deformation retract of the strip itself, so there is no continuous map from the space of all possible votes onto all possible results that respects unanimity. Therefore, it is impossible for an ordinal voting system to be continuous, to respect anonymity, and to respect unanimity. So, we proved that all of these things are impossible to satisfy at the same time, but what does it actually mean? When we go to vote, which one is wrong? For the United States presidential election, one of them is very obviously incorrect, and that is anonymity. Depending on the state that you vote in, your vote could have a very different effect on the outcome. All votes are not weighted equally. But what if it's a simple, direct election, like an elementary school class votes on what topping of pizza to get for the party? The votes should be equally weighted then. 
I personally think that the most likely condition to fail is continuity. It's not without justification, but it does seem a little more arbitrary than the other two. Maybe our assumptions when doing this proof were just too specific, and this has no practical application at all. After all, it does seem like a dramatic abstraction to treat a human's opinions as an n-dimensional vector. 